Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. I'm Caroline McGregor and want to welcome you today to today's webinar. It's co-hosted by a great group of three organizations, the Clean Energy Solutions Center, the Global Women's Network for the Clean Energy Transition, GWNet, and the Clean Energy Education and Empowerment International Effort, C3E. Today's webinar is the fifth in a series of six webinars on the energy transition and the role of women, and we'll focus on women's energy entrepreneurship. Vicki, on to the next. And just, just to give you a sense for how we'll spend our time together, before we jump into the presentations, my colleague Vicki will go over some of the webinar features, provide an overview of the, the three sponsoring organizations, we will then proceed with um, the, the main act here, the, the presentations from four great presenters. We have Ali Grunsky from the International Center for Research on Women, Mathieu Dahl from Energy for Impact, and Kabuki from the International Finance Corporation, and Per Anders Videl from the International Energy Agency. Following those presentations, we will take time to address audience questions. And we have, um, you will have seen that we, we bumped up the, the calendar items you have um, to allocate 90 minutes for today's discussion to make sure that we aren't severely time constrained as often happens, too often happens. We wanna have ample time to get to your questions. So please do submit them. Um, you should see a questions um, tab in the dashboard. Uh, as noted, this is the fifth in a six webinar series and thank you to everyone who's been here the whole way. Uh, the last and final webinar is scheduled for a week from Tuesday, the 7th of April. That one will be on networks promoting women in energy and we'll make sure to send the information on that in the follow-up email. Finally, after, after the webinar wraps up and um, you log off, we'll see a short survey popping up on the screen and just thank you in advance for taking time to give feedback on the webinar. With that, I'll turn things over to Vicki from the National Renewable Energy Lab, um, who will provide some instructions about um, uh, the webinar features and say a bit more about the sponsoring organizations. Vicki, okay. over to you. Thank you, Caroline, and thanks to everyone for joining today. Uh, before I begin, I have one important note that I do need to make, and that is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practice resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. So a few things to help you out, uh, things you should know before we begin. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. And if you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio box. If you want to dial in by phone, select the telephone option and a box on the right side of your screen will display the telephone number and an audio pin. Uh, again, a gentle reminder to our panelists to please mute your audio when you are not presenting. So to illustrate the features a little more clearly, we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. And you should see something that looks like this in the upper right corner of your screen. You can submit text questions to the presenters by typing your question into the questions panel and you can send your questions in at any time. Uh, Caroline will collect these and present them to the panelists during the Q&A session. And when you submit your question, if we would ask that you please include the name of the presenter that you're addressing your question to. Uh, please note that we have provided copies of various reports published by the Solutions Center, GWNet, C3E International, and the International Center for Research on Women that you will find under the handouts heading in the control box. And we invite you to download these uh, reports and later visit the websites listed on this slide to access these publications and more information. We will send this information out in a follow-up email so that you'll have it available for uh, later. 
So today's event is being recorded, and if you would like to review the webinar or share this information with others, an audio recording will be posted to the Solutions Center YouTube channel and to our website. And also you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to access the webinar recording. Now about today's co-host. Uh, first, uh, the Global Women's Network for the Clean Energy Transition, which is more commonly known as GWNet aims to advance uh, the global energy transition by connecting and empowering women working in sustainable energy in both developed and the emerging and developing countries. And they do this by connecting women through a range of activities, including networking, through their advocacy by generating and sharing information and providing mentoring and coaching and consulting services. And I'm also happy to share with you news about the release of GWNet's new Energy Transition Role Models campaign, which showcases uh, remarkable women energy entrepreneurs from all around the world. And the campaign is made up of a 14-part video series and an informative brochure with global, regional, and national resources that entrepreneurs can take uh, advantage of. Uh, the Clean Energy Solutions Center, my initiative that I manage, is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Solutions Center is structured to help governments design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. And this help is provided through an Ask an Expert Technical Assistance Service. Uh, this uh, service is uh, offered to governments free of charge and is designed to allow experts to respond quickly to questions. The Solution Center also engages in capacity building activities, such as this webinar you're attending today. And then the Clean Energy Education and Empowerment, or C3E International, is also a clean energy ministerial initiative and a technology collaboration program by the International Energy Agency. C3E International is a multilateral initiative working towards greater gender diversity in clean energy professions, recognizing that the transition to a clean energy future will only succeed if we harness all possible talent. C3E International aims to advance women's participation in clean energy by creating opportunities and closing the gender gap across five focus areas, which are data, mentorship, awards, dialogue, and also benchmarking and measuring progress, which they do through their Equal by 30 campaign. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Uh, first up is Ali Glinsky, a Senior Gender and Evaluation Specialist at the International Center for Research on Women and Associate Director of ICRW Advisors. Ali will speak to us today about a recent article on strengthening the women's entrepreneurship ecosystem within the energy sector. Following Ali, Matthew Daw, Region, Regional Director for West Africa at Energy for Impact, will tell us about women's entrepreneurship, enterprise and financing supports and productive uses of energy in West Africa. Then we will hear from Anne Najambi Kabuji, who is the Regional Gender Lead Africa at the International Finance Corporation and will tell us about IFC's Energy to Equal program, efforts to advance women's entrepreneurship through corporate supply chains and community engagement and investment strategy. And our final speaker is Per Anders Waddell, a program manager at the International Energy Agency, where he coordinates activities related to energy and gender. Pair is representing C3E International and will discuss how data around women's entrepreneurship in the energy sector can inform policy. And of course, uh, following the presentations, that Carol, as Caroline mentioned, we will launch into a question and answer session where our panelists will respond to questions you have submitted. So the Q&A will be moderated, as I mentioned, by Caroline. Uh, and Caroline is a consultant who has spent her career working at the intersection of climate change, clean energy, and international development. You likely know Caroline from her leadership and work at Sustainable Energy for All, where she was lead specialist in energy access 
and gender and spearheaded a range of initiatives, including the People Centered Accelerator, which was a multi, which is a multinational or multi, excuse me, a multi-stakeholder coalition for gender equality, social inclusion, and women's empowerment in the energy access arena. And now with introductions complete, we'll begin our presentations. Ali, uh, it will take a second, but after you received your prompt, over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, can you let me know if you can see my screen? Yes, we see your presentation perfectly, thank you. Okay. Um, all right, let me skip on through. Um, I'll skip the overview about ICRW uh, in reflective time, but um, feel free to go on our website if you want to learn more. I can provide more at the end as well. Um, so ICRW recently completed a systematic review with funding from Energia as part of um, RA4 research group. Um, this was done with Johns Hopkins University and Babson College, and the purpose was to investigate the existing evidence and identify gaps in understandings around gender and entrepreneurship in the energy sector. The results of this research uh, systematic review is a comprehensive 150-page-plus uh, report, um, which is linked here, but today I'm just going to be presenting some of the findings from that. As we consider women's engagement in the energy sector, it's important to first examine the roles women have played and investigate how these roles can be enriched or expanded to advance energy access. How and why women should be engaged throughout energy value chains differs by value chain segment and mode of engagement. This figure depicts the main roles where women entrepreneurs have been engaged in off-grid energy value chains. Um, an important distinction here is the difference between micro entrepreneurs and SMEs. You'll see um, on the far left, this is where the categorization of subsistence and growth um, is made. We find that female micro entrepreneurs are generally subsistence entrepreneurs, aiming to just make enough money to provide for their families. Whereas women who own SMEs are looking to grow their business and provide jobs for other individuals and therefore the types of support and services needed at those different levels is very different. Um, while women's engagement as owners and leaders in SMEs and high potential businesses is really important for expanding energy access as well as opportunities for women, today we're gonna focus on um, women's engagement at the micro entrepreneur level since, as you can see from the color coding, this is where um, most of the evidence was and also greatest potential for increasing energy access. Our research aimed to pull out best practices around what support and services helps female energy micro entrepreneurs succeed. We found that interventions such as business or financial skills training alone are insufficient to lead to substantive changes for women business owners over time, but rather intervention, a range of interventions um, operating across the ecological model are necessary to create an enabling environment for female energy micro entrepreneurs. This graphic provides an overview of the types of support and services needed to enable female um, energy micro entrepreneurs to succeed. And we'll now go um, a little more in depth at the individual level and some at the household and business as well. Um, so first at the individual level, um, first is provide business education and skills development. Basic business skills and financial literacy are necessary to build women's businesses. This includes accounting, financial planning, pricing and costing, marketing and inventory management. Um, however, our research found that there is fairly strong evidence that business skills training alone is insufficient for entrepreneurial success and rather trainings are most effective when they also include empowerment elements, which leads to the next point here, which is provide training to foster personal agency and initiative. These approaches consider individuals' thoughts, feelings, sociocultural environment, and work to build self-confidence and agency, or the ability to make an act on decisions. Next is facilitate access to finance and capital. Um, 
as you probably know, access to capital is one of the largest barriers faced by female entrepreneurs attempting to start and expand energy enterprises. There are many reasons why women face challenges when accessing credit. For example, gender inequalities in land tenure can make access difficult um, because they have trouble kind of demonstrating the collateral needed to obtain the loan. Different forms of capital are needed for micro entrepreneurs depending on the stage of business growth and also the business model of the company they're working with. First is startup capital. This is needed for female micro entrepreneurs engaged in sales and distribution of energy products and services to purchase initial inventory, such as um, cook stoves or solar lanterns, or to purchase energy provision equipment, such as a uh, solar kiosk. <clears throat> Next is microcredit. In some cases, energy programs work with micro entrepreneurs to access microcredit by negotiating for low interest loans with longer payback periods, or they can um, underwrite loans for entrepreneurs. Next is micro-consignment. Um, enterprises can also provide inventory through a micro-consignment model, wherein the entrepreneur pays back the inventory after making the first round of sales. Um, this model puts the financial risk on the larger enterprise rather than the entrepreneur and allows the entrepreneur to test the product and their sales ability without making a large upfront investment. Um, the next kind of recommendation is provide mentorship and coaching. This is a one-on-one -on -one relationship, usually over a set period of time in which an established business person or the mentor provides con consistent support, guidance, and practical help to a less experienced person, the mentee. Um, creating ongoing touch points for mentoring and networking can help female entrepreneurs feel that they have a support network to address business challenges as they arise and learn best practices from other entrepreneurs um, and also expand their network and reach. And finally, um, important to bundle services and provide targeted support. So while each of the supports described above shows significant value to women entrepreneurs, none of them alone is sufficient to support long-term growth for energy businesses. Um, however, there is compelling evidence that bundled services such as provision of capital, business training, and ongoing mentorship can be effective. Next, I want to um, just highlight the bolded points here at the household and business level. Um, so at the household level, we're gonna talk about directly addressing uh, conflicting responsibilities associated with traditional gender roles um, through engaging men. So women often spend a disproportionate amount of time on household tasks, limiting their contribution to micro-entrepreneurship, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, however, there's growing evidence that engaging men in programs targeted towards women economic empowerment can greatly improve the impacts of those programs for women and their families. Effective strategies include providing capacity building activities, um, which encourage men to adopt more positive gender equitable masculinities, promoting the benefits that men will gain from women's economic empowerment, encouraging men's roles in care work, engaging men in trainings targeting women, and identifying and supporting male gender champions. And then at the business level, we're gonna focus on the recommendation to improve alignment of business model and market development with entrepreneur assets and community needs. So different types of business models may be more or less conducive to engagement of female energy micro entrepreneurs, uh, depending on the context. And there are two key concepts to explore here. First is what is the entrepreneur doing? So it could be selling energy products, selling an energy service or fuel, or conducting after-sales service. And there are pros and cons to each of these models. When selling products, sales agents need to find a customer for each sale. So they might exhaust their kind of existing social network or the market can become saturated. However, with the sales of energy services, such as charging or sales of fuels or after-sales service, there is a recurring revenue stream and they don't need to go out and find a new customer, but rather existing customers um, repeatedly use the service. And so with these models, there may be more consistency, but also less growth um, for entrepreneurs, growth opportunities. 
The next point is the difference between micro entrepreneur and sales agent. Um, so a micro entrepreneur, often these things kind of get conflated and we talk about them in the same way, but they're actually quite different um, when we look at the business models. So micro entrepreneur is someone who does not have an official contract with the enterprise, is paid on commission and does not receive benefits. Whereas a sales agent is a contracted employee who has some form of base pay, maybe commission on top, and may receive um, benefits from the enterprise. Entrepreneur models often enable enterprises to provide income generation opportunities to a greater number of women. They're well positioned to reach customers at the last mile. However, they may involve more attrition and may require more training and capacity building. Alternatively, sales agent model may be may have more kind of business sustainability and be a better fit for sellers in urban and peri-urban locations. However, they likely provide um, income generation opportunities to a fewer number of women as they're more restrictive and selective on the types of women that they engage as sales agents. Um, two examples here for the first one is Solar Sister, who uses an entrepreneur model. They target last mile populations and have found that the women they engage want more flexible work options that can be balanced with other income generation activities as well as care responsibilities. Solar Sister values providing income generation opportunities to many individuals versus a more substantial opportunity to just a few. Um, they focus on working with the most marginalized women as their entrepreneurs and so they invest heavily in training and capacity building of their micro entrepreneurs to build their skills. Um, alternatively, EnviroFit currently uses more of a sales agent model. So EnviroFit actually started with an entrepreneur model, but over time they found um, the women they were engaging as entrepreneurs needed a lot of support in order to develop successful businesses. And um, also these women often didn't seem as interested in developing high growth businesses, but rather were just using the entrepreneurial engagement to supplement their own other forms of income. Um, EnviroFit found this problematic in that they were investing a lot of resources in training these women, but were not able to reach retention levels and sales per, per entrepreneur that justified the investment. Therefore, they shifted to a sales agent model in which they use a much more narrowly defined criteria for recruitment of sales agents, for example, needing past sales experience, so that each individual seller is able to have um, able to move more products with less investment. I think the conclusion here from this difference is just that there are pros and cons to each model and enterprises need to explore how best to leverage women's contributions while designing an approach that will provide um, women with an income generation opportunity and also enable the enterprise to sell products into the market. That's all for my presentation today. Um, open to questions at the end of the session, but for now, I'm going to hand it over to Matthew. So, so thank you for the introduction, Ali. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to get the opportunity to speak to you all today. So my focus today uh, will be to explain the kind of business support programs that we implement across Africa, especially to support women entrepreneurs and get you understand how we can scale them up. So um, very briefly, uh, Energy for Impact, we are a small uh, non-profit uh, 15 years old, uh, working in Africa, and our mission is to support uh, entrepreneurs, uh, including women entrepreneurs, and we mainly support uh, two kinds of women entrepreneurs, either those selling energy products and services, and also uh, women that are from whatever sector, but that are going to be upgraded, uh, the business are going to be upgraded thanks to energy, so the productive uses of energy. So typically, the kind of women entrepreneur that we support is, for instance, willing to access a solar fridge 
or uh, a solar pump or similar uh, equipment. So, um, a woman entrepreneur in a last mile rural Senegal, for instance, usually faces uh, many obstacles that prevents her from having a profitable business. I think uh, Ali has uh, given quite a lot of ideas, uh, but just to uh, come back quickly to it, uh, I think the kind of question uh, these women entrepreneurs ask themselves uh, would be, uh, will I be able to speak uh, to the energy supplier who is an old respected man, much more educated than me? Uh, how do I run my business more effectively? How do I choose the right appliance and energy source? How can I access financial resources? So um, we, uh, in response to, to these questions, we support these women entrepreneurs providing new ideas, uh, BDS support, so business development support, technical support related to energy, and capital access support, as well as networking and agency training. So this kind of support really brings many positive impacts, uh, as you can see in the table on the right. Uh, I would like to highlight the increased profitability and the creation of jobs, but also a greater participation uh, by women. So the diagram uh, on the left shows, for instance, how much value uh, was created in a program that we implemented in Tanzania, where we supported entrepreneurs uh, newly electrified through a grid connection. So you can see that the value created between the estimated value of the job creation and the value of the increased revenue for the entrepreneurs is much higher than the initial investment uh, to implement the business support program. So this is a, a good story to tell to a, a potential donor. However, uh, despite the high return on investment that we've just seen, uh, these kind of programs are still very expensive programs. Uh, they are human resource intensive, and they also take quite some time. Uh, they can also be frustrating uh, because you always have some drop off, especially among the youngest women. Uh, moreover, you can't control as much as you would like to, uh, especially uh, because the men have a good part of the decision-making power, as uh, you also heard in the presentation before. So you need to involve them to increase your control over the program. Uh, at last, I wanted to highlight that these are not easy programs. You really need a lot of expertise uh, you need to be able to do a lot of field work and support cultural uh, changes. So typically women in uh, rural West Africa ambition for their businesses is limited to getting enough money for the urgent needs. So stepping up to the next level can be challenging. So how uh, can we scale up uh, this kind of program? So because it is expensive and complicated, you need to find ways to scale up. And to do so, uh, we focus on organizations that work or could work with the women entrepreneurs. So there are many of them. Uh, so you can see, for, for instance, the financial institutions, the energy product suppliers, uh, for instance, a supplier of solar pumps or solar fridges, as we were saying before, NGO, uh, the civil society, the government, uh, and also big businesses. So in each case, there are specific services that you can provide and specific outputs that this actor can bring so that uh, it will make it easier for the woman entrepreneur to uh, upgrade her business. So to take a few examples, uh, if we speak about the financial institutions, for instance, 
you can explain uh, to the financial institution the market potential uh, of having women as clients. You can bring, for instance, a, a guarantee fund or a dedicated credit line to do a pilot, for instance, so that the financial institution can give credit for solar pumping. You can also uh, have the financial institution linked with energy suppliers. Uh, all funds can be raised so that the financial institution can set up a specific credit line. So the output of this kind of work is that you will have, for instance, a suitable financial product for the woman uh, with a good interest rate, limited guarantees, requirements for the women entrepreneurs, and a suitable reimbursement scheme. So as far as the energy suppliers are concerned, uh, what they usually need is uh, working capital, uh, most often. So you can help these energy product suppliers uh, to raise this capital. So this will allow them to provide supplier credits to the women, for instance, uh, which uh, will make it much easier for them, for the women, uh, to get uh, the equipment, for instance, the solar fridge or the solar pump, as we were saying before. Uh, it can also allow the energy product suppliers uh, to have enough stock, which is also important. So NGOs are also uh, an actor that can contribute to scale up uh, these kind of initiatives. So usually what we see is that most of them are willing to provide uh, clean energy sources and solutions to their beneficiaries but they don't really know what kind of products uh, are suitable uh, because they often lack the energy expertise to, to choose the right supplier, the right equipment. So this is typically something that you can bring to them. Uh, so you can bring this, this expertise. Of course, you can also support the government, uh, especially through gender audit of the policy projects or programs. Uh, this can bring much more focus on gender mainstreaming. And at last, you can also work with big companies uh, and help them to see how women can be included much more in the value chains. For instance, in the distribution network, but also at other functions. So all these actors uh, will then enable uh, the environment for the women entrepreneurs. And as a result, supporting them, uh, we will have a good chance to see much more women entrepreneurs accessing energy and upgrading their business. So this is it for, for today, for me. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hand over to Anne from IFC. Anne, are you speaking? You may be on mute. There you go. We're still unable to hear you, Anne, if you're speaking. Uh, 
Hello. Oh, there we are. We can hear you now. Oh, thank, thank you. So, so sure. sorry about that. Thank oh, you okay. so much. Thank you so much. So today I'm going to take you through uh, one of the projects that we are running in renewable energy on reducing gender gaps with the private sector. And I also wanted to run you through two of the case studies that we have uh, supported and published with uh, two of our leading um, lighting global programs in Kenya and India, uh, just to showcase some of the lessons that we have learned and some of the best practices that you know you could apply to support and boost women entrepreneurship in energy value chains. So there's something that my, there we go. So, I mean, it goes without saying that gender equality is important for um, economic growth. It's good for women, it's good for business, and it's good for countries and communities overall. And most importantly, closing gender gaps in such male dominated sectors like renewable energy is important to words, you know, enabling access and also promoting their participation as uh, entrepreneurs and employees as well. So this is our approach at IFC. We work with the private sector to close gender gaps across various thematic areas. So we look at women as leaders, women as entrepreneurs, women as employees in various sectors. We look at how companies can take advantage of the underexplored women, women's market segment. But we also work with you know, um, various companies in sectors like infrastructure, natural resources to understand women as stakeholders and the value that they, they bring as well. So on to energy to equal. The objective of this project is to work with the private sector companies to explore and reduce gender gaps across leadership, employment and entrepreneurship and also support companies to build gender inclusive community engagement practices that can actually increase you know, women's participation in projects that are being uh, implemented at a community level as well. This is working with companies across uh, sub-Saharan Africa and how we are implementing this is through uh, four key uh, components. We have a peer learning platform. We are, you know, uh, ramping up on research and case studies to increase sub-Saharan specific uh, data. We are looking at, uh, at supporting those companies with, you know, farm level advisory services so they can identify the gaps, they can build internal capacity to reduce those gaps, and they can also be able to access tools and resources that can help them, you know, um, implement their action plans. And we're also looking to work with women and other like-minded partners in the sector to bring uh, to bring together women professionals in this sector in a community of women in renewable energy where they can access information, where they can access mentorship and where they can actually look for opportunities around career development and other developments around the sector. This is where uh, our components lie. Um, as I mentioned, number one is research. We have a peer learning platform that bringing together 10 to 15 renewable energy uh, companies. We have a farm level implementation and we also have the network on power uh, by women entrepreneurs. So how does this work? So bringing together companies um, to put in place action plans and measure uh, the benefits of implementing those action plans over a period of two years. So we have four buckets of um, commitments, if you like, or four buckets of thematic areas and three core buckets and one is around advocacy and leadership. So looking at leadership and workforce, uh, commitments around increasing women's employment in the sector, uh, commitments around tackling key barriers like childcare is one of the biggest issues, and especially not just for employees, but we are seeing this, you know, duplicated in entrepreneurship work as well as women entrepreneurs compete between running their business and their household chores as well. Talking about maternity and paternity and building flexi hours so that you know women can join and stay in the workforce, and addressing sexual harassment and you know violence in the workplace issues as well. Of course, today we are talking about group B, which is about promoting women's entrepreneurship. And we are looking at this from, you know, core areas. One of them is women in energy distribution networks, how private sector companies can un better understand the gendered um, aspects of their distribution networks and support women to address those 
unique constraints that women face. But we are also looking at another aspect that also can have huge impact on women's entrepreneurship, which is uh, supplier diversity programs where women, can, where, where companies can uh, take actions to buy more from women-owned businesses as well. We also have community engagement strategies, um, undertaking gender assessment and um, addressing the risks around gender-based violence, as well as looking at supplier diversity efforts in, far as, in as far as local content uh, issues are concerned. So this is uh, our membership at the moment. Uh, this is a two-year program, and after these two years, we'll have a review of this uh, peer learning platform and get ready for another two years of engagement with hopefully this and another set of private sector companies. That is energy to eco and then going on to uh, lighting global so our uh, energy to eco work uh, is building a lot from what uh, ifc and the world bank group has been working on through the lighting global global program which was uh, primarily focused on enabling access you know to solar around the world and what we did kenya was one of the earliest programs on lighting global and then those lighting asia there has been lighting nigeria and lighting many other countries so we looked at how those uh, programs programs were impacting or promoting women's entrepreneurship in energy value chains. And while we were doing the Kenya case study, which is one of the case studies that I was leading, we realized that women were seated at the bottom of a pyramid. So women were micro and small entrepreneurs and they faced, you know, some very, you know, um, complex challenges trying to break into you know retail or wholesale and they mostly just sat at the bottom of the pyramid so the the, the program put together um, a suite of uh, interventions to support this women at the bottom of the pyramid with your small and micro businesses so it was a kind of a, a blended cocktail of, of, of interventions that included business skills uh, training, uh, personal agency training, uh, mentorship and coaching where these women were paired up with mentors and coached over a period of time. There was access to suppliers issues because very early on, if you remember in the solar uh, space, there were very many not so good quality products and um, you know there was a lot of trust issues with, with consumers and they needed to be able to access uh, a diversity of products first and foremost but also very high quality products so that access to markets gap needed to be bridged and of course access to financing because a lot of these women were relying from small savings and small uh, borrowings from you know um, women groups and, and circles as well and one of the things that you know we realized when women went through this program they were able to grow their businesses number one and then number two they were able to to experiment with a few things like getting you know more support in terms of manpower so they would get uh, more people to drive their sales and that had an impact on the revenues but they were also able to organize my, themselves so that they could extend credit to their consumers and one of the things that was quite stuck in this uh, case study was that most of the of, of the customers for the women that we worked with tended to be women who were buying you know small sort of household level um, appliances. In India, the story was pretty much the same, but the difference is that here we work with a company called Dharma Life, a social enterprise that was working with more than 60,000 uh, rural entrepreneurs and 75 of those uh, were women and were reaching more than 10 million beneficiaries. And what this company realized is that women were just getting on board because they, they found that, you know, selling solar products was actually profitable and they could juggle the business and, 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 their, and, and their new household chores as well. And what we worked with uh, Dharma Life to do is to help these women professionalize their businesses and be able to, to scale up um, as well. So we introduced two things, a blended approach uh, to the learning where there were classroom and uh, on field activities as well, and a screening tool that helped Dharma Life to select um, the women entrepreneurs who would benefit from, from this training program. And what we found that um, the women that were screened and inducted and trained this through, pro through this program had 17% higher sales than women who were not able, you know, who were not trained 
under the program. And as a result of this training, um, Dharma Life was able to, to cut attrition rates as well. So they were able to maintain their distributors. They were loyal and they were growing and they were reaching more people as well. So from, from this work um, and other, of course, examples that, that we do in women in distribution networks in other sectors as well, we found that this um, five key constraints were quite uh, pressing and peculiar to the women in uh, solar distribution networks. Number one was access to finance and because they sat at the bottom of the pyramid operating small and very micro enterprises, they, they, they were not uh, either formalized, they didn't have the stringent documentation that formal banking institution would require, so they were still relying on uh, um, women groups, more savings, borrowings within families, and for those women who were able to grow their uh, their businesses to a point where they could get loan, for instance, from an MFI that was making a real difference to their businesses as well. Business management skills that was very crucial and critical at that level that these women were operating. We also found that access and use of technology was, was a big deal for these women. Those, the, those that had smartphones and were you know, uh, digitally literate so they could access information on suppliers, on new products, on where to find them. But they were also using social media and WhatsApp and, and other channels to market as well. And they tended to be more savvy and it, it was obvious that their businesses you know, would be more more professionally ran and was of course um, selling more and the networks and access to information uh, this this was actually an acute issue uh, we realized in some of the uh, regions where we're working in Kenya the only networks and the only you know meetings and, and spaces where women could get to network with other women and to meet suppliers as well because the program would bring the big suppliers to this level was through this program and through this program they were able to learn from each other they were able to access some of the suppliers that they only heard of and as a result they were getting to grow uh, to grow their businesses and they were able to sell more high quality products and were gaining more credibility um, within their uh, market segments and of course access to markets again as I mentioned earlier they, there was a huge gap between where they were operating and where you know the big suppliers were operating so getting access to those diversity of products so they could advise their clientele and also the, the quality of products at, at that point when this program was running was quite um, critical to their success so I'll stop there and uh, we'll We'll take questions later on and then um, we invite Per Adair Widell from International Energy Agency to carry on with his presentation. Thank you very much for that, uh, and thanks for the invitation, and, and hi to everyone. Uh, I can see in the participation list many familiar names, uh, but also very new names, and I want to thank uh, GWNet and Solutions Centre for bringing C3 International together with these initiatives, and also, of course, everyone who's joining this webinar. So my name is uh, Per Vidal. I'm IAE uh, Program Manager at IAE. Uh, which means that we'll see a, a number of different activities, but that includes also our gender work. Uh, today, you might say that I have two hats. Uh, of course, the IA hat, but I'm also here uh, mainly to represent C3 International and the important work on uh, improving data on gender and energy. So I think this is a great opportunity and thanks to the presenters. Uh, I find all those presentations very interesting and it's good for us also to get some more insight on uh, women entrepreneurship, as this is an area which so far we have not done that much uh, data collection, uh, as I will uh, speak to you in a few minutes, but really something which is the core, of course, of the development of the energy sector. So, uh, next slide, please. And uh, yes, you saw this slide before, but just to uh, reiterate. Uh, the, the C3 International Initiative is under the Clean Energy Ministerial and the IAEA Technology Collaboration Program. It's led uh, by, the US, the, by the US and Canada, and I want to thank those countries for their great leadership. And we see uh, a constant number of increasing countries uh, joining uh, the initiative. Uh, 
We, uh, as mentioned by Vicky before, uh, the work has uh, five focus areas. So data collection, mentorship, awards, uh, communication, and also the standalone initiative, Equal by 30. And today I will focus on the first pillar here, so data collection. And uh, I'm doing so also as the is uh, coordinating this work and supporting Italy uh, in, in, in the work. So ne next slide, please. Yes, so uh, I forgot to mention, but this uh, initiative overall has been existing only two years and a half. Uh, we have, uh, and this work stream on data collection is uh, one of the more active ones and the one from the start led by Italy, uh, but all members uh, participate actively. Uh, we have learned a lot during the two first years. Uh, we have done a number of activities. We had two reports, one uh, that you can see here on your right, which also is uh, a reference document to this webinar, and I encourage all to, to read that. Uh, so, but it's besides doing, uh, working together between these countries on developing data on participation in public and private organizations, looking at uh, policy practices, uh, the, the last two years has been very useful as well to understand what are the limitations when it comes to data collection and some of the challenges as well. So uh, it's not only about doing the reports, but also discussing and how and what method methodologies are we actually using when we collect data. So this uh, month, we formal, even if we've been supporting, uh, IE has been supporting this uh, since inception. Uh, our role was formalized this month. Uh, as we're now the coordinator and supporting Italy and other governments uh, on taking this forward. Uh, and uh, a few things to highlight before I uh, give some more examples of the work we are doing and intend to do. Uh, one thing that is very important is, of course, to focus on the right matters. Uh, what I mean with that is focus on matters on data that can actually influence and shape the policy discussion that can help uh, uh, advancing gender diversity in both public and private organizations. Of course, we've seen over the past uh, many initiatives signing up to uh, the will of advancing gender diversity, but then of course, how do you do it? And with data and information, we can inform policymakers. Uh, what I said before too, of course, with uh, the challenge of getting robust data uh, is something that we learned over the last two years. And especially if you want time series that goes back uh, in decades, uh, one thing might be that governments don't have this type of data, but it also another challenge, of course, that different governments are collecting data in very different ways, uh, which makes the comparison difficult. Uh, another learning has been, uh, which I think is important as well for the energy sector, is to not uh, compare itself to everything, but compare itself to uh, comparative sectors, so looking at mining, construction, uh, and other sectors which has uh, uh, been dominated by men uh, over decades. And this is also to better understand uh, what is the progress, is it slow or fast, is it, um, and also of course, what are the policy uh, efforts needed to kind of uh, find, tackle some of the barriers that women face uh, in comparison to men. So today, uh, during this webinar, I want to shed light on two topics where we have data. And these are developed by our chief statistician uh, and some of our data experts, really looking at uh, uh, gender diversity in decision making, but even more so on entrepreneurships and innovation. And this latter, of course, connects very well with the webinar. Uh, but as I said before, this is something which we haven't looked that much at in the past, but uh, very much want to do so in the future. So next slide, please. So the next slide, thank you. Uh, well, coming back to uh, the first topic, so decision making and what's the, what does it look like when it comes to gender diversity in decision making? There's a number of uh, figures out there uh, on the overall workforce. Well, to start with the work, workforce saying that 22% 20 of the workforce of the energy sector, uh, mainly oil and gas sectors, are, are women compared to men, uh, which of course is much lower than the average uh, in the economies. Uh, and if you look at the re uh, renewable sector, the, high, the numbers are higher, around 30% uh, from the numbers we got from ARENA. 
And of course, if you look at bores, uh, it's, it's much lower than that. But coming back to how do we get the data to really understand what is the progress and how does the energy sector do in comparison to other sectors? So by looking at some of these initiatives where ambitious uh, companies sign up to different uh, 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 initiatives which are trying then to uh, promote gender diversity, uh, that's a way for us to get data. There's the 30% club, there's equal by 30, and that is where we can find data, uh, especially when it comes to the, the composition of boards. And here, this is just one example to show you that companies that are joining these uh, initiatives, uh, of course, have a higher number of uh, a female on their boards than the ones that have not joined these uh, initiatives. It's not a, it's quite a safe bet, of course, but at least this helps us to get some form of data that can compare the energy sector with other similar sectors. And by that, kind of starting a discussion on why does the energy sector do not as good as other similar sectors, and what does it mean for the energy sector if it wanna secure the skills for the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but then turning into uh, Another very interesting area, of course, coming to uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, by the next two slides, we're going to look at patents and also founders of companies. And this is on a uh, both a global scale that we're looking. But this particular graph here is on is from the European uh, Patent Office, uh, where we can clearly see that uh, men, uh, sorry, that women uh, in the energy sector, we have much fewer women in the energy sector. Uh, that are uh, uh, having patents than in other sectors. And this is a, a, a I mean, to come back to my point before of how do we make sure that we look at the right and most interesting data, the most relevant data for having a discussion with uh, policymakers. And my previous speakers here also mentioned access to capital as being one challenge that women face to a greater extent than men. So here again, showing that the energy sector uh, that the number of patents per women uh, is lower than the number of patents uh, of women in other similar sectors. Next slide, please. The next slide, uh, which is one of my last ones, is just looking at uh, entrepreneurship from a different angle. Here we'll look at the founders, which of course is also linked a bit to uh, access to capital. Uh, here you see a number of variety of very different sectors, everything from sports to apps and uh, hardware. Uh, and again, seeing that the energy is uh, somewhere in the middle um, or in the lower range uh, when it comes to the percentage of female, uh, when it comes to founders of companies. And this again is an important signal back to policymakers trying to figure out then of course, okay, what, why is this and how can we tackle this? with uh, policy measures. Uh, maybe not all of them will be in the energy sector, of course, but this is a reason for a Minister of Energy to talk to a Minister of Education, a Minister of Enterprise uh, to figure out, uh, again, because uh, coming back to the overall topic of these webinars, cleaner transition, and if the energy sector has an issue with attracting talent, in uh, particular from underrepresented groups as women, uh, it could be, of course, uh, has an impact on the long-term uh, plans. Finally, my last slide is just uh, saying that uh, C3 International uh, could be a, a hub for this and should be seen as a resource for all, all international initiatives, but also everyone out there that are interested in, in data collection and in knowledge building on energy and gender and we're happy to continue dialogue with you uh, after this webinar as well. Uh, in the meantime, just to mention as well that to be able to support this initiative, we have established a IA Gender Diversity Initiative, which helps us also building up uh, capacity within the IA, which is something new from this year uh, or, early, or late last year. So things are moving in the right direction. Um, uh, but I think again, uh, we, I will, as was said in the beginning, this is a very important uh, issue and it, 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 we have to go from uh, vision and ambition to actually actions. And a, fun, a fundamental part of that is of course data collection. And uh, we hope therefore that we will be able to work with uh, other international initiatives, but also 
people joining this webinar uh, to move this agenda forward. That's my last words. Uh, I will now hand, uh, hand back to, to Caroline, but also happy to hear from uh, participants in this webinar, any type of ideas of what you would like to see we collect data on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pear. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ali. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Anne. Um, that was a really marvelous um, survey of the landscape, which is um, quite vast, as we know, um, and kind of it varies quite a bit. Um, I think from Ali, we heard um, some, we, we got some great frameworks. She, she made an important distinction, I think, between um, micro entrepreneurs and and sales agents and the kind of business models that that go behind those um, the the categories uh, of subsistence um, entrepreneurship versus growth entrepreneurship I think that's also helpful for us to keep in mind um, she made the excellent um, never to be gotten never to be forgotten point of needing to engage men um, and make them part of the solution um get their buy-in uh from, from Mathieu we heard uh i think a, a really important dimension that maybe uh, goes unnoticed when we talk about women energy entrepreneurs i imagine what most of us uh come to mind uh is a, you know the solar sister the women selling small pico solar devices that just tends i, I would imagine that's the um, mental image that's that's rooted in our consciousnesses um, but uh, I think energy for impact brings in that important dimension of um, looking at the the entrepreneurs who are women whose businesses can be upgraded can be benefited with the additional provision of energy Matt you mentioned solar fridges you know people who have a, a, a vending um, beverage business let's say um, or solar pumps um, in the agriculture domain. Um, he also mentioned the very important uh, word <laughs> of scale. Scale is um, it's the ambition everywhere, right? That's that is what true success looks like. Um, is to not just identify good solutions, but to take them to scale. And Matthew, I really appreciate it though. Um, that very dense, but but excellent slide of um, working with the different institutional actors and, and where they can be part uh, part of a solution. Um, and I'm talking about everyone's frameworks, but and I really appreciated the, the pyramid that you showed. It kind of went by quickly, um, but I think the, the five categories are so important. And I think IFC is really doing so much good leadership work here. Um, with its gender secretariat, which I, um, to my knowledge, is pretty unique among international organizations. Um, but, but like that taxonomy again of uh, women at the leadership level, women um, as entrepreneurs in a value chain, women as employees, women as consumers, um, women as stakeholders. Um, that that's a very similar breakdown to what the 2x challenge uses. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, um, started with the G7 development finance institutions uh, and this commitment to double their uh, their investments in um, women focused businesses and, and the criteria are along those same five lines leadership entrepreneurship on employees consumers stakeholders um, I also really liked and the supplier diversity programs I think that's kind of a term of art that um, we can we can all adopt um, again, supporting companies to buy more from uh, from women-owned businesses. Uh, I definitely noticed that there seems to be a pretty strong consensus around uh, the components of a good entrepreneur women's entrepreneurship support program. We heard it from Ali. We heard it from um, Anne, and I imagine also from Matthew that. Um, there's the hard skills, if you want to think of them that way, the business skills, the accounting, the bookkeeping, the, um, the, the biz side of, uh, of being an entrepreneur. 
but then also the personal agency training. And I think that's um, been pretty, which I'm happy. Um, confidence um, support is is so um, is so critical. Um, we heard mentorship uh, um, factoring into these programs over and over. Um, and then of course, enabling and supporting the access to resources that are needed, whether it's suppliers or finance or uh, networks, technology, information, markets, what have you. Um, so uh, super, super set of presentations. From, from you, Pear, we heard um, one of my own personal pet issues, um, the need for more and better data um, to inform our efforts going forward. Um, the need for more consistent methodologies. And um, you asked this really great question, which I think I will use as my first question to the full set of panelists. And that's the uh, way you said it was, what data do we aspire to have? And um, maybe if we can go in the same order that um, we had originally, Ali, Mathieu, Anne, then Pear, what, what data do you wish you had on hand, you know, if you could have a magic wand and the data would be there um, uh, at your fingertips, what would that data be? So um, I, think if, I think you can take yourselves off mute and just chime on in. And for, for the audience, I, I see several questions have come in and they're all noted. I will get to them um, shortly. Keep them coming. Um, this is Allie. I guess, you know, as a researcher, we're always just looking at um, wishing we had, and sometimes this isn't possible in kind of real life situations, types of research that's looking at like what um, types of support for entrepreneurs leads to kind of X percent increase in sales or productivity or, um, you know, <laughs> enhanced energy access. So just having more kind of experimental um, programs that have a research component that identify specifically the input or support provided to the entrepreneur, and then the output being their kind of sales and performance that would then help us to see what is kind of the minimum package of most effective support and services that actually enhances um, social impacts for the entrepreneur as well as business impacts for the enterprise. So that's not very specific, I know, but I think just um, building research and measurement into entrepreneurial programs so that you can then later do some of that analysis to understand which support and services seem to be most effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tracking tracking the impacts. And I appreciated also the, um, yeah, the experimental side of things. We just have to try a lot of different, different programs, like different designs, like, and, and keep good data and see what works. Um, we're still in, in a pretty early stage of, of um, embracing this. There have been great pilots, there, there have been great programs, but they are um, not at scale yet. Um, and yeah, I'm right there with you, Ellie. Um, and just that's my plug for, uh, you know, from donors, it's a, a little bit of a greater risk appetite to, to be willing to try some things that might not work out because we don't know, because we don't yet have the data <laughs> to, to prove that it will work. Um, but who knows, it might, you know, you have to take a, you have to make some bets. Um, and, and collect the data. So thank you. Mathieu, what do you think? What data would you like to have? <laughs> so thank you for the question. Uh, so I think that um, when you are working with a, a woman entrepreneurs that are selling uh, energy products, uh, it is quite easy to 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 get numbers around how many people get access through your work, but because we are uh, at Energy for Impact working on productive uses of energy, uh, the way to measure impact is a bit different. 
this is not so much about uh, how many uh, access uh, you get because when a, a woman get a solar fridge she just get a solar fridge but this is much more about uh, the new services that you provide to the community and uh, this is quite difficult to to measure that uh, we are uh, little by little trying to put some methodology to measure that but uh, i think and i don't know a, a very uh, a clear methodology to do that so we are trying to get this kind of data and this is not easy uh, but uh, yes this would be very interesting for 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 us or for organizations that are working on productive uses of energy to be able to measure this kind of impact. Mm -hmm. um, and Per, I noticed that he mentioned methodology. I don't know um, to what extent there's a role for some of the big data institutes that are part of your um, international network um, to kind of collaborate or contribute or support um, or convene some of these methodology conversations, but I think that's, um, we're all kind of building, I did an old boss who, who called it, building the airplane while you're trying to fly it, right? Or flying it while you're trying to build it. Um, mm -hmm. We're just figuring it out as we go. So thank you, Mathieu. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, what, what, um, what data would you wish that you had on hand um, to leverage in your memos to your leadership or, or what have you? Hi, thank you, Victoria. Um, I, I think of this from two perspectives. Number one, from the workforce side of things, which is an area we work um, a lot in, and a lot of the you know questions we get and and things we hear companies tell us is where are the women? Would love to get more women into our workforce, but we don't get women. And when we get them, they're, they're, you know you you meet them at the door as receptionist and administrative kind of staff. So what we find that is we don't have enough pipeline data to connect uh, the supply and the demand. So would like to know, for instance, how many women is the market churning out into the into the labor market? Markets, or you know, what are the constraints to women's access to um, the kind of skills? And these would be STEM skills that will, uh, you know, eventually enable them to get into the um, into the renewable energy uh, labor. And also just getting to connect the two, so that the companies that we work with have a kind of a healthy pipeline that they can draw from. But we find that you know there's a disconnect there, and we quite do not know, you know, what sectors these women choose to work in, in the wider um, STEM related um, sectors, and how can some of those skills be pulled into the energy sector. So I hope we can get to a point where we, we understand where, the, you know, the gap or the shortage lies. Um, and then the other area is on the uh, entrepreneurship side. One of the very good success uh, stories that we've had is with the banking sector, and we're moving that now in to the uh, insurance sector where we have been able to estab establish as, and articulate the business case for incorporating women in, in their businesses. And we've seen banking do this very well in terms of reaching to women customers, etc. The insurance sector is doing the same. But we need to, to solidify and articulate and sell the business case for um, you know, renewable energy companies to work with women as, as distributors in their value chains. We have seen in the FMCG sectors that women, and this is where women distributors are mostly concentrated because a lot of these are fast moving household consumer goods. So a lot of women find themselves by default just getting into that um, kind of businesses. So how do we then prove to renewable energy that, you know, working with women, especially as last mile distributors, can help you, you know, get into newer market segments and also, you know, help you grow your bottom line while contributing to women's economic empowerment by, you know, getting more women distributors as last mile distributors and growing those women into bigger businesses at retail and wholesale as well. So this is one of the areas that will be digging deeper and doing a bit more research on with the companies that we are working with and we'll be sharing some of the case studies and other reports that will come out of energy to eco in the coming years. That's wonderful and thank you. Um, those are those are great points, right? The pipeline um, question uh, shows up everywhere and um, it's another place where 
um, data um, could be part of the solution. And so interesting to hear about the banking sector and, and fast moving consumer goods and insurance just as places to look for potential, um, you, you know, we're always needing to point to successes um, to replicate. Um, and yeah, I, 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 you laid it out in a very compelling fashion, I would say. Um, why, why renewable energy companies would benefit from from leveraging women as distributors to access last mile market segments, et cetera. All right, Pear, last but not least, what data do you wish you could snap your fingers and have? Thank you very much. Well, I um, well, I guess our, I, mean, I will have a different answer than our chief statistician. Um, I'm sure they have a long list of things they want to get, but for me, coming from a policy background, I would say I'm really curious about more better employment data and coming coming back to the what I said before of kind of showing where are the skills gaps that we're facing uh, in the energy sector and bringing those to attention of policymakers and, and ministers around around the world to realize that this could be an issue and showing those gaps and I know the industry has uh, some of that data but this is also to make uh, this topic, um, gender diversity, a bit less political sensitive, more focusing on this is something that all should be interested in. It's not a of political color. It's more of a it's a strategic question for the energy sector. And showing those gaps can help uh, informing government and policymakers on what's action, if it's education, if training, that are needed. I think that's uh, on my wish list. That's a great pair. Thank you. It's a great wish list. Um, we'll tell the universe and hopefully the universe will provide. Um, I'm looking at the clock. We have about 12 more minutes in our time allotted. So I'm going to go straight to the audience questions. And I think I'm going to do them in batches um, so we can whip through as many as possible, as fast as possible. Um, all right. So for Anne, great question from Pam Baldinger. Um, is it possible for outsiders who, um, from the research space to view the peer learning platform or see the case studies you mentioned? Okay, so that's for Anne. Question, Ali, for you. Um, the questioner uh, works for an organization that has done uh, training for women who are in the mining sector in Ecuador and during the needs assessment, they discovered that many women didn't want to be minors um, and instead wanted to be trained to become beauticians. So the question is, how can we be sure that we're targeting women with an interest in the sector before embarking on a project? Sort of the recruitment and selection question. Thank you for that question. Um, uh, let's see, Pair. Uh, a question for you, Pear. Has there been any research on the gendered aspects of the full renewable energy supply chain from minerals to supply and servicing? Um, that's a big question. Uh, all right, that's, I'm realizing that's more than enough uh, for the time being. I guess, Pear, you have to match here. Let me give you one. Um, there was a question from uh, a colleague, do the financial institutions, for example, if it's a donor, does the donor give funds directly to the entrepreneurs that you work with, or do they send the funds directly to the organizations, the NGOs, the intermediaries who work with them? Thanks for that question. Um, Okay, so uh, I know we threw a lot on the table, but hopefully we can go one by one and you guys remember um, which question you're fielding. So can we go in order again, Ali, then Mathieu and Pear? Sure, thanks. I think, um, so the question about um, providing a training for women in the mining sector and then finding out that they don't want to be in the mining sector, they'd rather be beauticians. That's a tricky one. Um, but I would, I guess I would say, first of all, that reflects that you're already doing the right thing by doing that um, formative research or pretest, whatever it was that enabled you to find that information out. 
Um, so that's great. I think that's, you know, if you're going to be doing a training, kind of first understanding what people's desires and needs are is really important. Um, I suppose it's tricky because on the one hand, if you're a mining company and they don't want to be miners, then that is a bit outside of your scope. I think um, one thing is that in this particular example, there's interesting differences between those two sectors that you gave. So while working in the mining sector might be kind of worse working conditions, safety, or even um, exposure to sexual harassment and those types of things, there's also benefits that women may not even quite realize that having kind of a more formalized job would give them access to higher level pay, more benefits, more kind of consistency and reliability compared to a more informal job, such as being a beautician. Um, so I think it's helping workers recognize where they're, you know, what are the benefits and trade-offs of different industries, but then selecting those who want to be there and, and doing the training with those people. If they ultimately don't want to be in this sector and are going to drop out as soon as possible, then it's not going to be um, a good investment on your part to train them if then they'll just leave because they'd rather be doing something else. Um, so I think, yeah, identifying that in your recruitment and selection, but then also trying to understand why it is that they might not want to be in that sector, or why they're expressing that they'd rather have a different job, what are the kind of challenges they're facing, and then thinking about what you can do to address those challenges. Of course, they can be big things like sexual harassment in the mining industry or physical safety. These are big things, but then, you know, if you want to provide good work opportunities for those women, what can you do to address some of those other concerns um, that might be beyond whatever the initial training you had in mind, but might actually create a better um, workplace environment for those women to help kind of recruit and retain female workers or entrepreneurs. Um, and finally, I guess maybe just linking people with other resources, NGOs in the area, if ultimately they wanna be doing something else, you can't do everything, but linking them with those resources. That's great, Ali. Mathieu, to the question of financial institutions and how the funds get channeled. Okay, uh, so uh, thanks for the question. So uh, usually this is uh, quite difficult to get uh, some funds from donors, uh, such as uh, a guarantee or a dedicated credit line uh, that we can uh, deposit in a financial institution. Uh, there are some uh, exceptions and this is quite uh, useful. Uh, because it helps a lot to build uh, the financial mechanism with the financial institutions. Uh, so uh, when when we when we get this kind of funds, we usually uh, discuss with the financial institution. Uh, depending on the situation, we either decide to uh, to to put a credit line, a dedicated credit line, uh, or a guarantee fund, or any kind of uh, other. Um, kind of um, uh, facility, financial facility. Um, one thing is that uh, we we never uh, channel the funds uh, directly to uh, the woman entrepreneur. Um, we don't provide subsidies, for instance. Uh, so we try to be as much as possible uh, close to the market reality, uh, to what the market is. So we, we help them to uh, either raise the funds from the financial institution or from the energy uh, supplier who can do also uh, credit, supplier credits. Uh, we also help them to uh, raise their own funds. Uh, and usually uh, the final, uh, way to acquire the equipment is a mix of all these different solutions. So a bit of their own funds, 
uh, mixed with a bit of uh, financial institution credits and uh, energy supplier credits. Super, thank you. And over to you, a question about access to the peer learning platform. Sure. Um, so, uh, first and foremost, the two case studies that um, I, I presented are available on our website, ifc.org slash gender, and then you will find all other information on, you know, our energy case studies and the energy to eco information as well. We do uh, not have a standalone uh, website at the moment, um, but we do learn um, webinars uh, and we'll be doing a series of webinars over the next year and a half or so. So would love to be able to share the information and the new reports and case studies that uh, we get out of this um, uh, program. So happy to uh, connect with, with you, Ali, Matthew, and Victoria and Caroline and see how we can tap into the network and disseminate wider. You can also okay. follow us online, uh, hashtag energy to eco. We post all our information and webinars on there. Thanks, Anne. Care that uh, question about the renewable energy supply chain and the gendered aspects. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks for that. And the question as, as well, I uh, honestly don't know. I would uh, mm -hmm. suggest that, uh, I mean, if there are case studies on the supply chains of the renewable sectors, IRENA might be a good. Uh, organization to contact or GWNet as well. But again, coming back to the, the challenge of finding good disaggregated data, uh, this could be a problem, but might be case studies. Uh, not a good answer, but I, I don't know actually. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a big question. Um, excellent work, you guys. We have about two minutes left. So rather than, uh, I have a whole long list of questions we could stay here for the rest of the day, but I will hand things back over to Vicky who can wrap us up and um, let you all go on with your days. Great. Thank you um, all so much. Yeah. And Caroline, Allie, Matthew, Ann and Pear, thank you so much. Um, before we adjourn, I'd like to give you um, all an opportunity to provide any final remarks and thoughts. I know we don't have much time, but if any of you have anything you'd like to add, Here's your opportunity. Uh, Allie? Um, no, just thanks so much for inviting us to be a part of this uh, webinar series. I think it's really great, you know, as my findings showed and others have presented, part of what we need here is networks of sharing information, building off of what each other is doing um, in order to understand what works for women all over the world. So. Thank you for facilitating this and um, happy to be part of this learning community. Great, thank you. Matthew, any remarks? Thank you very much too. Uh, this was very interesting for me. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to say uh, to the participants that uh, uh, I'd be happy to share uh, any uh, uh, kind of uh, knowledge or documents around what we do. Uh, so don't hesitate to 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 ask if uh, if you're interested in the subject of uh, productive uses of energy thank you very much again mm, great thank you Anne. Um, thank you so much. It was great pleasure to sharing what we are doing and learning from all the presenters. Uh, what I would only say is I would love to uh, stay connected and to be able to collaborate a bit more with yourselves. And of course, I've seen you have a quite diverse um, list of attendees today, which was really great. And it would be good to learn a little bit more of what everybody is doing. Terrific. Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, Pear. Well, thank you very much, Vicky, and, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, the only thing I can think about is that the other panelists had much nicer photos than I did. Yeah. Uh, sure. I can assure <laughs> everyone that hair is a very uh, friendly looking human, a very smiling. <laughs> Not the serial killer. No, but thanks again. I think we uh, agree with other panelists that this is uh, 
is great then with the new, using the web tools that we have we should use it definitely for more conversations like this to really bridge uh, what we're doing and and finding ways to work together so thank you very much yeah absolutely um excellent you know i'd like to close by once again extending a gracious thank you to all of you, our expert presenters, and also to our attendees. Um, we very much appreciate your time and your participation. And we really hope you found today's webinar valuable and you are taking away some good information that's helpful to you. Um, just a quick reminder that a short survey will pop up after we end the webinar. And we appreciate you, you know, taking just a minute or two to answer the survey questions. It's very short. So with that, I send you all good wishes and particularly in these unsettling times, please stay safe, stay healthy, and this concludes our webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Vicki.